We often discuss technology. We often try to understand how a fighter is going to behave in an actual conflict comparing the technologies available. And we do ourselves a disservice because the most important element in each weapon is the man in control. This is the story of how clever tactics could overcome technological superiority. Welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. Please stay with me till the end because the stuff that we discuss here is not easily found anywhere else on YouTube. Before starting, let me say a huge thank you to Dario Leone and mention his website theaviationgeekclub.com. It was the main source for this video and he very kindly let me reuse some of his material. You should add this site to your bookmarks and check it every week. It's extremely interesting. Link in the description below. When Iraq attacked Iran in the autumn of 1980, the Iranian Air Force was a shadow of its former self. During the Shah reign, it was the best trained and equipped air force in the Middle East, but the Islamic Revolution brought drastic changes with it. All the armed forces were affected and the highly sophisticated air force was one of the most affected elements of the Iranian defense. The Iraq Air Force, at the same time, it was a well-trained and well-equipped Air Force. It was aware of the sorry status, and it was convinced that they could defeat the opponent and establish the air superiority. They were convinced that the Iranians, despite their high-tech equipment, could not sustain their operations for a very long time without the help of the United States. That was not going to come, for sure. They were going to be proved wrong. Iran originally placed an order for 80 Tomcats and 714 Phoenix missiles. By the time relations between Tehran and Washington were interrupted in April 1979, 79 F-14s A and 240 uh, Phoenixes were delivered and about 100 crews had been trained. However, Iran never received any of the advanced AIM-7F Sparrow and AIM-9H Sidewinder missiles. Those were intended to complete the panoply of its Tomcats, and thus for the first months of the war the plane had to serve armed with Phoenixes and just the 20mm General Electric M61A1 Vulcan 6-barrel cannon. It was only in the spring of 1981 that the engineers of the Iranian Air Force adapted the fleet to carry the older and less reliable Sparrow 7E and the Sidewinder 9J. The lack of American support also had a deep effect on the readiness of the F-14 fleet. No more than 12 to 20 planes and 30 crews were full emission capable at any given time. However, this was enough to maintain three two-ship caps during daylight over the Kazakhstan, Ka the Karka Island and Tehran. Despite all of these problems, the F-14 was capable of establishing an uncontested air superiority in the area of operations. The AWG-9 fire control system outranged anything available to the Iraqis and so did the Phoenix missile. Expecting to fly against the F-14 and be in the position of fighting it, well, it was delusional at best. While the MiG-23s could pick up the AWG-9 radar emissions and at least be aware of its presence, older planes like the MiG-21 or the Sukhoi-22 did not detect the American radar while it was in track while scan mode. On their side, the Iranian pilots demonstrated a great ability in using the Phoenix range to the maximum extent possible. The Phoenix lob trajectory meant that dozens of Iraqi pilots were shot down with no warning, out of the blue. The effectiveness was so great that the approved tactic against an F-14 became drop the payload and run. Obviously, the Iraqi had to do something. In 
In April 1981, the first of 86 Mirage F-1 EQ started being delivered to the Iraqi Air Force. The Mirage F-1 was a great improvement on the Soviet planes already available. Quick, modern and sophisticated, maybe it was not a match for the F-14, but it was surely an opponent to be respected. The Mirage F-1 will progressively become the workhorse of the Iraqi Air Force. So, armed with their new fighters, in the autumn of 1981, the 79th Squadron was ready to try something new against the F-14. In early November 1981, the commander of the 3rd Air Defense Division, Brigadier General Nagdat al Nakib, I hope, ordered that every Iraqi airstrike would be preceded by a couple of Mirage or MiG in the attempt to distract the Tomcats from the ground attack planes. So, in the late morning of the 15th of November 1981, a pair of MiG 23E M from the squadron number 39 approached the Tomcats on station north of Awadz to attract their attention. As the Iranians left the station to intercept the incursion, two Mirage F-1 led by Major Mukhalad, I hope, sneaked upon the F-14 at a very low altitude from the opposite direction. Once the two low-flying interceptors reached the 20 km mark from their targets, the ground control issued the predetermined code word GIRAFFE, ordering the pilots to climb at full afterburden and power up their radars. The two Iraqis established a radar lock and fired at least two Super 530F from a distance of about 10 km. Taken by surprise, the Iranians were left with too little time to react. One of the F-14As received at least one direct hit, which forced the crew to eject. For the first time ever, the Iraqi Air Force had scored a confirmed kill against an F-14 Tomcat. None of the planes the Iraqi used in that occasion was superior to the F-14, either in terms of technology or in performance, but a clever tactic was capable of achieving surprise and score a hit against an enemy that so far appeared invincible. The Iraqis, emboldened by this success, tried two giraffe operations on the 24th of November, shooting down or heavily damaging one F-14 in each operation. Then, the Iranian reacted. They started to be more cautious and watch their back for mirages coming up from the ground and obviously the effectiveness of the tactic was reduced as they started to rely more on quick scramble operations. In any case, we have news of at least another successful giraffe mission. The losses of F-14s in the Iran-Iraq war are still disputed and different sources give different numbers, but we know for sure that the giraffe missions happen and they change the operational pattern of the Iranians. In this case, we have seen a classical example of one side just relying on its technological superiority being forced to react by a clever tactic. This is something that has always happened in the history of conflict. Every action causes a reaction. Every victory has the seeds of defeat inside. So the next time when you marvel at the next new science fiction technology, just have a mental note that maybe there is a clever hack that will render all that technology useless. And by the way, if you wonder why these missions were called giraffe, the reference was to the Mirage flight profile that basically sort of resembled a giraffe snack. So, if you like this video, I'm sure you will love the videos that are going to appear beside me. In the meanwhile, please like, dislike, subscribe and hit the bell so you won't miss anything. And if you could consider supporting the channel on Subscribestar or Patreon, that would be amazing. In the meanwhile, thank you very very much for watching and see you in the next video.